Welcome everybody to our monthly series lectures on chronic pain and fatigue. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Gary Kaplan. I'm Dr. Lisa Lillianfield. I've got, been a colleague of Dr. Kaplan's for 30 years and worked closely with him for the past 15. Dr. Kaplan is founder and medical director of Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine in McLean, just a few minutes from here. He's author of Total Recovery, Solving the Mystery of Chronic Pain and Depression. He's a pioneer and leader in the field of integrative medicine and only one of 19 physicians double boarded in family medicine and pain management. He's clinical associate professor of family medicine at Georgetown University School of Medicine. And he was recently appointed by Secretary Sebelius to serve on the advisory committee to health and human services for ME and chronic fatigue syndrome. So join me in a warm welcome Dr. Gary Kaplan. So Dr. Lisa and I started out together when we were 12. <laughs> so it's a cold wintry night. They're threatening uh, snow tomorrow, uh, which should assure us of the not having any. Uh, we've passed the solstice. We've survived the holidays. Uh, and the days are slowly but surely getting longer, so hope does bring eternal. So I welcome you here tonight, and uh, thank you for uh, braving the elements to come out. How many people uh, here have chronic fatigue or know somebody who has chronic fatigue? Okay, so <clears throat> it's a big issue. It's a big problem, and it's a complex problem for a large number of reasons. And what I'm gonna go through tonight is kind of an understanding of where the definitions are at this point in time, uh, some of the research that's been done on it, uh, some of the medications uh, that have been suggested, our take on it in terms of what we do at the Kaplan Center, um, and hopefully get you a little bit better understanding. There's a lot going on with this topic at this point in time. So uh, we've just gone through a P2P um, process at NIH. The P2P is uh, Pathways to Prevention. Uh, the purpose of a P2P is to look at the state of research and find out where the gaps are. All right. This is kind of the way the bureaucracy is starting to shake itself awake and say, okay, this is a problem area. We need to be paying attention to it. How do we organize ourselves to do so? And so getting through the P2P, while an imperfect result, nevertheless was an important result in terms of getting us to start advancing uh, knowledge and uh, finding new treatments in this field. Uh, the next step that's going to come is the uh, IOM, the Institute of Medicine, has uh, been asked by the secretary to come up with a better definition, a uh, clinical definition of uh, chronic fatigue, myalgia, encephalomyelitis, and that's going to be coming up next month. We'll have that released. <clears throat> These processes are imperfect. These processes uh, frequently leave as many questions as they leave answers. Uh, there's a lot of controversy around them. Uh, the chronic fatigue uh, community has been uh, somewhat abused over the years, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, really, there's a problem of, of severe underfunding with regards to this disease and uh, for research dollars, and we are uh, hopefully going to be able to start addressing that in the next year with the completion of both these processes, the P2P and the IOM. So let's talk about this and talk first about what this is. So. <clears throat> What's in a name? You know, we've got lots of confusion about this. Is it chronic fatigue syndrome? Is it myalgic encephalitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome? Is it myalgic encephalomyelitis? All right, and for the most part, it becomes very important to understand what the name is, all right? And there's a lot of controversy because chronic fatigue syndrome has felt to be somewhat dismissive of really what people are going through uh, with this condition. And we'll talk about the specifics of that in a little bit. The other part of the problem, though, is if you can't define what it is you're looking at, you don't know what you're studying. The end result of which is you get really diverse results across a wide spectrum uh, that vary from the incidence of the disease. So if you look at the CDC criteria, the incidence about 0.24%. If you look at the Canadian Consensus Conference, the incidence varies between 0.4 and 1%. Fukuda and, and Oxford pretty much have been dismissed at this point, the P2P itself recommended abandonment of the FACUDA, I'm sorry, of the Oxford definition. FACUDA is really more a research definition uh, based. And if you go up to the Reeves empirical criteria, you end up with a, a percentage of 2.54%. Uh, 
These numbers are not, are not something that you can ignore because these numbers really get the attention of the NIH and say, you know what, this is of a level of a problem that needs X number of dollars of funding. So it really is important for us to have a very good understanding of what percentage of people have this disease. And it's very important that we come to an agreement about what the definition is of the disease in order for us to study it properly. So huge amount of controversy sitting out in the field with regards to this stuff. But it's beginning, I think, to come to an, uh, to an agreement about what this should be. So myalgic encephalomyelitis versus chronic fatigue syndrome. This is the CDC definition that we're presently operating with in this country. Patients with myalgic encephalomyelitis must have post-exertional malaise, and this post-exertional malaise is extremely important in the diagnosis of this disease. All right? This is a crippling problem for people with, with chronic fatigue syndrome, all right? or myalgic encephalomyelitis, which by the end of this lecture, I hope we're all in agreement that that's what we'll be calling this moving forward. So <clears throat> the post-exertional malaise, debate as to whether or not it needs to be really six months or shorter, of unexplained fatigue and several of the other possible symptoms. There's feeling in the community that chronic fatigue syndrome as a label is stigmatizing. It really is, doesn't give the full depth of what this disease is, and it also doesn't say anything about the pathophysiology of the disease. Chronic fatigue accompanies a huge number of different diseases, and so it's nonspecific. And so it becomes a significant problem because we have physicians who dismiss this diagnosis, who don't believe the diagnosis exists and are abusive. I can tell you stories of what my patients have been through where they are just plain not listened to or believed. Uh, they're sent to psychiatrists. Uh, they're just sent out of the office and told, I don't know what else I can do for you. So the, the chronic fatigue label has actually been one that I think has been ultimately uh, used by many medical professions to say that it doesn't exist. This couldn't be further from the truth in terms of the existence of the disease, and I think getting rid of the chronic fatigue label is going to be beneficial moving ahead uh, as we better define and treat these problems. They're used interchangeably. There's a long history of, is it chronic fatigue? Is it myalgic encephalomyelitis? Um, and so Health and Human Services, a number of years ago, said, okay, we're going to combine them. It'll be ME slash CSF, okay? I think we're moving to the next stage of this, as I said, where we'll hopefully move to an ME as the, as the final, actually, disease process that we're looking at. So again, looking at the CDC criteria for this, it's a chronic fatigue syndrome, debilitating complex disorder characterized by intense fatigue that is not improved by bed rest and may be worsened by physical or mental exertion. All right, we're going to talk more about this, but this is a very important criteria. So the diagnostic criteria by CDC says, severe chronic fatigue for six months, consecutive months or more, that is not due to ongoing exertion or other medical conditions associated with fatigue. So it's a diagnosis by CDC of exclusion. I think we can also potentially move past that and get more specific about making the diagnosis. Fatigue significantly interferes with daily work and activities. An individual uh, concurrently has four or more of the following eight symptoms. So they have post-exertional malaise lasting more than 24 hours. That post-exertional malaise, I think, will be, as you'll see, uh, move to the forefront in terms of uh, diagnostic criteria. Unrefreshing sleep, uh, significant impairment in short-term memory or concentration, muscle pain, pain in the joints without swelling or tenderness, headaches of a new type, pattern, or severity, tender lymph nodes in the neck or armpit, a sore throat that is frequently reoccurring. So this is where CDC thinks things should be. There was a Canadian consensus conference in 2003 that I think did a much better job of, of defining this disease and subsequently an international consensus conference that set out specific criteria in 2011. These are the criteria by which uh, most of us on the committee believe should define this disease uh, and we'll see whether or not um, the IOM improves on this or ends up uh, adopting a very similar uh, definition of this disease. But this, by the international consensus criteria, the disease is myalgia encephalomyelitis, period. None of this chronic fatigue stuff, all right? It's a complex, acquired, multi-system disease. The pathophysiology is profound dysfunction or dysregulation of the neurologic control system, which results in faulty communication and interaction between the central nervous system and the major body systems, notably the immune and endocrine systems, dysfunction of cellular energy metabolism, and ion transport and cardiac impairments. 
We'll go through what all that means in a minute. Since 1969, the World Health Organization has classified myalgic encephalomyelitis as a neurologic disease, all right, something we've been a bit slow to accept in the United States. This business of post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion, PENE, or also referred to as post-exertional malaise, PEM, it's a pathologic low threshold of physical and mental fatigability, exhaustion, pain, and abnormal exacerbation of symptoms in response to exertion. It is followed by prolonged recovery period. Okay? Note that unlike the CDC criteria, specific duration of symptoms is not necessary. This, people who have this disease, okay, when they attempt to exercise, when they attempt to focus and concentrate over any period of time, okay, and it's variable according to the severity of the disease in a given individual, get exhausted. They have trouble recovering from that exhaustion. I mean, it can be crippling. It can lay them up in bed. It can leave them incapacitated for days. This is not a mild thing, and you cannot push yourself through it. Quite the contrary, attempting to push through it will cripple you more. So this is really the hallmark of this disease, this post-exertional malaise. And the exertion applies not just to physical activities, but also to mental activities. So this is very, very important in terms of this new definition. Then you get to start your Chinese menu, okay? So out of one of the neurologic impairments, you have to have at least one or more of these to help make the diagnosis in addition to the post-exertional malaise. Neurocognitive impairments. People coming in complaining of brain fog, difficulty concentrating, short-term memory issues. All right. Pain, generalized headache, hyperalgesia. The co-occurrence of fibromyalgia, generalized pain syndrome, is extremely high with this condition. And at one point, we kind of regarded them as a spectrum of, this, of a similar condition. We've sim since taken fibromyalgia and had it in its own category and separated it out from chronic fatigue. But the fact of the matter is there's a huge overlap between these conditions. All right? So pain is very common in people who have myalgic encephalomyelitis. Sleep disturbances, difficulty starting sleep, difficulty maintaining sleep, difficulty with circadian rhythms. They go to sleep at 9 o'clock but don't fall asleep until 4 o'clock in the morning and then will sleep until 3 in the afternoon. So this can become a very severe problem. Neurosensory, perceptual, and motor disturbances, weaknesses in the extremities, problems with being klutzy, falling, losing your, space, your, your location in space. So all of these things, which people, they're soft symptoms in many cases, okay? And if we don't ask about them, we don't find out about them because people are somewhat embarrassed to tell us about them because they've been dismissed so many times in the past. I don't know how many of you have encountered physicians where you tell them that, you know, you're having difficulty focusing and concentrating. And then they'll say, okay, can you remember these three words? And they'll give you a short memory test, and you're fine, and they say, you know, next. So you've been dismissed. You haven't been listened to. The fact of the matter is these symptoms are real. These symptoms are quite debilitating for these people. And they take people who are otherwise at very high functioning levels. I have people who are executives uh, who are functioning in the international community and no longer can do so because their brains do not work the way they used to. Okay? I have one guy, <coughs> CEO of a major corporation, uh, prior to the onset of this, he, math was done in his head. He knew basically everything he needed to know about his business, which is a very large corporation, uh, in his head. He knew the numbers. He knew who, how many employees he had. Uh, he could go into a uh, meeting to make a deal, and he could uh, do all the numbers in his head in terms of uh, pros and cons of whether or not the deal should be concluded. He's no longer capable of doing that. All right? He's capable of functioning more of the human level of you and I, uh, certainly me, but uh, he can't function at the level he was functioning at. All right? This is debilitating to him. He can no, no longer do his job. So this brain fog, this neurocognitive deficits, is a very real and a very serious uh, event as part of this disease process. Pain is also a very serious problem, and we'll get to that. So something, at least one of those, and most commonly, most people have a couple of those. Also, you need to have something from the immune, gastrointestinal, and genital to urinary uh, impairments. So people who have recurrent flu-like syndromes, okay, they'll get better, then the flu comes back, this goes back and forth and back and forth. Generalized fatigue, generalized aching, uh, problems with fevers that come and go. Susceptibility to viral infections with prolonged recovery periods. They get sick, but they take weeks, months to recover from a simple viral infection. 
uh, gastrointestinal complaints. This has a whole range of things in terms of uh, irritable bowel syndrome, problems um, with gut motility issues because of autonomic dysfunction, uh, gastroparesis. There's a whole range of issues. Again, if you don't ask and you don't get the details of it, you become dismissive, oh, they have irritable bowel syndrome. You know, you got to fit it into a great big picture and say, no, this is part of what's going on with this individual. This is indicative of a neuronal gut dysfunction, and we need to pay attention to this. General to urinary complaints, frequency of urination. I have people who get up 15 times a night to go to the bathroom with urinary frequency. Urinary workup by urologists is proved completely normal. Problems with the discomfort on urination, pain on urination. Uh, there's a whole range of things that go on with that. Sensitivity to food, medications, odors and chemicals, also a, a big deal. This business of multiple environmental sensitivities. And all of this is about a brain kind of on fire. So the brain gets overwhelmed fairly quickly. Uh, I have uh, one younger patient who has chronic fatigue syndrome. We have to be very careful about how much stimuli he gets because he'll get completely overwhelmed by it. To the point where if he's going out where there's crowds around, we'll put uh, noise reduction headphones on him so that he can go out and be able to participate uh, in other activities. And we're very careful about gauging how much activity he's participating in so that he doesn't get overwhelmed sensorily. So lots of factors that come into this. This is a very disabling disorder. People get exposed to perfume. can be completely laid out uh, as a result of it. So lots of problems and medication reactions that seem somewhat bizarre unless you, you start seeing the pattern that's coming on. Energy transport, ion transport. So we see cardiovascular issues, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. These are situations where people will talk about going from lying down uh, to standing up and passing out. So up, down, down. <laughs> and you can get severely injured in the process of doing this. <laughs> Been there, done that, have you? <laughs> There's this sense of air hunger, again, a pulmonary workup will reveal nothing. Important to do, we need to rule other things out. But uh, these people are complaining of the sense of never quite getting a full breath, never quite getting enough air. And this symptom, again, can come and go, which is the other problem with this. So you can have it for a period of time, it can improve, and then come back. Loss of uh, thermostatic stability. Cold all the time, hot all the time, sweats, back and forth. So you're, you're having a devil of a time. You're hot, you're cold, it doesn't matter what the environment is and intolerance to temperature extremes, so that if you get really cold weather, these people get really sicker. If you get really hot weather, these people get really sicker. So you've got to be able to take all this stuff and A, believe them, and then start seeing this whole pattern. So as you're putting this together, it requires time to take a very comprehensive history from these individuals because it affects multiple systems within their bodies. And so you really have to take the time. To, it's not just, you know, I've got low back pain. It started three days ago when I lifted uh, a sofa in my house, and uh, I've been in pain since. Here, do this, 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 and you're fixed three weeks later. Okay? This is one where we've got multiple systems. We've got to get a sleep history on them. We've got to get uh, an immunologic history on them. We have to get a uh, cardiac history on them. And we also have to do a very in-depth uh, physical exam on them as well. So when we're doing uh, blood pressures on them, it's not enough to do blood pressure with you uh, sitting at the table side. Uh, you have to do blood pressure and pulse with them lying down for five minutes and then have them stand up for three minutes and five minutes and again check blood pressure and pulse if you're looking for this stuff. You don't look for it, you don't find it. So these are complex diseases that take a lot of time to diagnose because we have to spend the time to collect all this data and get a clear picture of just how severely impaired and in how many different ways the individual is impaired.